Welcome to Stacky Podcast. This is the third of a three-part series that I recorded during the BTC Prague conference, in which I discuss Bitcoin adoption all around the world. So in this episode, I discuss Bitcoin in Africa, in various African communities, with Herman Vivier from Bitcoin Akasi and Brendan Mine from Uganda and from the Gorilla Sets project. So what we discuss is uh, Uh, Brendan's quite an adventurous trip uh, from Uganda here to Czech Republic. It's uh, quite uh, quite a funny story. Then we discuss uh, Bitcoin adoption in uh, unprivileged communities and how Bitcoin improve uh, improves lives in uh, over there in uh, African communities. This show is brought to you by Trezor. Trezor, that's the original hardware wallet and a pioneer in many aspects of uh, self custody. So if you go to trezor.io, you can uh, check the selection of various models and accessories. My favorite one is Trezor Model T because um, that allows you to set up a so-called Shamir backup, which is a great tool for improving the security of your recovery seed because then you are not re- relying on just one single seed, but you can split your seed in a safe way and distribute it geographically. So go to trezor.io and check out the selection. Brains is a Bitcoin mining tools company that helps you deciding whether uh, mining is for you, whether you have uh, the correct ASIC and the electricity uh, tariff, so you can find out uh, whether mining actually pays off for you. So if you go to brains.com with double I, you can check out their Bitcoin mining insights, Bitcoin blog, and all the other tools for Bitcoin miners. And Brains is also a publishing company because they recently published my book. It's called Bitcoin Separation of Money and State. And you can check that out and buy it from Brains as well. So that's Brains with double eyes dot com. And the final sponsor of the show is Biomasichko.cz. That's a biofarm here in Czech Republic that specializes in a high quality uh, grass fed cows. So if you are looking for a good top quality beef here in Czech Republic, you can go to biomasichko.cz, use the promo code STEKUI for 10% off, and you will get uh, the best beef in your life straight to your door. So biomasichko.cz for the best beef in Czech Republic. And now on to the show with Herman and Brendan. Hello and welcome to the STEKUI podcast. My name is Joseph and I have two very special guests here today. It's Herman Vivier from South Africa, founder of the Bitcoin Akasi project. Hello, Herman. How's it? And I have Brendan Mwini from Uganda, founder of the Gorilla Sets Initiative. Hi. Hi, how are you? So I want to start with how you actually got uh, here in Prague for the BTC Prague conference. So maybe Herman, start with you. And because you um, had a hand in getting Brendan here, here into Prague, right? Yeah, yeah. I had a... Played a small part in that. <laughs> so, so yeah, tell us the story. Not so much small. Uh, well, how I ended up here was, I mean, it's partly thanks to yourself, man, because, uh, I mean, we met for the first time in Ghana last year at the Bitcoin Africa conference. And uh, you told me about the conference coming up in Prague, um, suggested that I reach out to the organizers and hear if they want any involvement from, from that side, and which I did. I reached out to them. I actually reached out to them via yourself. So there was an introduction there, which I'm very grateful for. Um, yeah, and they, they they asked me if I wanted to play a part in the conference. And so we had a booth here at the conference. And uh, as part of that, they they gave me a couple of extra tickets to you know try and generate interest on Twitter. And one of those tickets was uh, sort of given away in a little Twitter giveaway that ended up you know <laughs> getting quite a bit of attention on Twitter. Right, and, uh, yeah. and that's how Brendan got his ticket. Right, so you organized the giveaway, and uh, what was uh, what was the uh, contest like? What uh, did the followers have to do? Well, well, I mean, I, I basically just asked asked the followers, look, if you had to start a circular economy, where would you do it, and 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 why, and 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 how? And um, I got I received not too many replies, um, but I received four decent replies. And then I took those four replies and I turned that into a Twitter poll and I asked people to vote for the best reply. And Brendan's replies was one of the replies and he ended up getting a good number of the votes. 
um, not the most votes, but he got the most quoted retweets. And I thought, well, that's actually a be- better measure of of uh, of support. Uh, it's it's easy to press vote, and it's a little bit more difficult to quote the tweet and say something. And he had a whole bunch of people who were just, you know, right. So, Brendan, yeah, yes. uh, what was your reply? I mean, um, the 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 usually things that you post on Twitter and you think, yeah, I'll just take part in this. You never know. Yeah. It was one of those things. So I, I saw the call. <laughs> I'm like, I would want to build a circular economy. So I, I pour my heart out there. And <clears throat> so when the Twitter poll went up, that's when everything started to get real. Like the guys started off, the the people I was, I was in the Twitter poll with, Oh, they had voters. I don't know where they were getting them from, but it was like they were a mile ahead. So what I did, I posted it in the different communities that we have. I am in touch with um, mostly the Kenyan community, then plus my community in Uganda. And before you know it, I had people who are voting me from Nigeria, like people who have interacted with my work. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the the kind of Bitcoin work I tried to do in Uganda. We try to do online classes. We try to like we had we have a Twitter handle where we talk about Bitcoin. So there's a lot of different people that came together and the idea was um when you get Brindon to Prague he will not pick something and leave it to himself. So uh the voting process went on. I had a lot of people commenting. People I didn't even expect started routing for me. It was like, there are guys who even created a separate Telegram group and they were adding their friends, vote for this guy. I mean, heck, it even reached the extent of my um, my old schoolmates. They got to know about it. They were texting me, Brindon, we are voting. You have to go. So it was really exciting but also really scary because I mean, from the part of the world where I come from, it's a bit hard to like, um, when you get the ticket, cause I knew the ticket was actually in the first place thought the ticket was like everything covered. And, <laughs> and then I got to find out it's just a ticket. So it's just a ticket for the so, conference. Uh, yeah. when, when it got to winning, then I start to hesitate. I'm like, now should I win? If I don't <laughs> win, I've already discovered that there's a community that uh, is actually growing, but um, I I was lucky enough to win and started to prepare because <laughs> winning the ticket was something, but getting here was another. Yeah, that's what I'm curious about. How uh, how easy or hard was it for you? I mean, I've been I've been uh, a Bitcoiner since uh, 2016. I got Bitcoin only in 2020, and the most use case I've had for Bitcoin is give someone sats, receive sats. This uh, just getting to Prague has given me a real life use case for Bitcoin because when I won the ticket, um, I'd previously known about Geyser, but for maybe a meetup, I'd received sats. Not really something that was very personal to me. So I put up a Geyser, I'm like... Take Brindon to Prague. Take Brindon to BTC Prague. Put up the gazer. I posted it on Twitter. Uh, Bitcoin Ikasi was very kind enough. They posted on their official handle. Mm. And within four days, I had raised Bitcoin worth 1,690 mm-hmm. US dollars. And that, that changed a lot because, I mean, Bitcoin is, uh, it's easy to, to stay surface until Bitcoin directly in a room where no one is and Bitcoin is helping you. That's when you understand the power. So four days was, I mean, I had put the, the max amount of contribution time to a month because I thought who raises 1,600 in, in four days. I'd put it to a month. So in four days it was cleared and Haman was like, you might actually come to Prague. And that is when, <laughs> like now, every after you finish a hurdle, the next becomes harder. So the next was um, the visa. Mm-hmm. Oof, yeah, how a lot it? of work. <clears throat> because the Czech Republic doesn't have an embassy in my country. Right. So they have an embassy in Nairobi. So I first wrote an email because I went to the website and read the requirements, wrote a long email with everything that I need, sent it out 
think it took them about one or two days to respond. And they were like, no. So since you're in Uganda, you can't come to Nairobi. You'll have to get your visa from the French embassy in Uganda. Mm. So I had to like go through the application process again. I applied. And I think the French embassy has a lot of applications coming in. So it was <laughs> it was a bit hard for them to prioritize a person who is first of all late. Because I said the visa application three weeks to BTC Prague. Right. The first week was wasted away in dealing with Nairobi. Yeah. So I um, submitted my application two weeks from the Monday, the last mm-hmm. Monday when they issued it. So the whole first week, I didn't get a response. Now, the weekend of uh, the first week, those two weeks, the two weeks uh, in which I got the visa, <clears throat> I got to talk to some people who are like, no, we have people we can talk to who can talk to other people. Obviously, that involves some money and everything. Right. Yeah, but <laughs> not actually some money, but uh, quite some. Quite a lot. Yeah. So they put in the word and the f- the week went by i didn't get a response so this week that we are in which is the b- the week with btc prague yeah i knew and i mean i'd given up the truth is i'd given up i'd actually started to plan i'm like now how will i ask guys to send back this money like i was starting to plan how to like get back people their contributions because it's not working and on monday <sighs> the embassy calls me at three. They called me at 3.36. I remember perfectly. <laughs> they called me at 3.36. I live about four kilometers away from the embassy. And uh, I picked my visa by four. On Monday at 4 p.m. And the conference starts on Thursday, three days yes. after that. Yes. And you just got the visa. <laughs> yes. I had not booked a flight. I didn't have a hotel. I didn't have anything. <laughs> and. But you had a ticket. I had, I, had, I, had, I had the most important requirements. I had a visa, I had a ticket. So it was, how do I connect? Yeah, how do I get there? <laughs> yeah, but something that happened that was, I mean, talk of challenges. On Monday, the Bitcoin price went down. <clears throat> Yeah. As it and always does. All, always does. all the funds raised were in Bitcoin, right? Yeah, they were still in Bitcoin. Yeah. So I had to take a, the hard decision of, I have one day almost to book a flight, figure out everything and wait for, obviously the Bitcoin price always comes back, goes up, comes down. So I was like, I can't wait for it to go back up to have the same value. So I have to pick the value that, so I picked about 1,000, I think I'd removed about $200 for the visa. Mm. Then now I got about 1,300. Left, yeah. Yeah, so I removed that. My ticket was 1,200. <laughs> and that was the cheapest ticket because yeah. I, like when I'm going back, I'm going to use about 31 hours to travel. 31 hours. Yeah, because I have like a lot of cheap connecting flights. Right. Yeah, I'll go to what, Budapest. What's the travel route? Like, uh, where, I'll, which go, I'll go from um, Prague to Budapest, Budapest to Riyadh, Riyadh to Dubai, Dubai to Entebbe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the reason I chose that is the route that was coming, the, the inbound route was very flexible. It was 13 hours. Mm-hmm. So I got the tick, they got the visa Monday. I booked... Tuesday, I booked uh, Monday night. I think Tuesday morning, it was like past midnight. And Tuesday, I was supposed to fly on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had like Tuesday, threw things in the bag. And Wednesday, I was at the airport. It was my first time to have a visa in my life. It was my first time to book a plane. And I did it on my own. It was uh, a first time... To go past, you know, when you accompany people to the airport, there's where you stop. So yeah, I'd been, security check. Yeah, I'd been like pushing people to there, to there. So, yeah, I got to cross the place, got to see the airport, entered, and it was really fun. But it was also scary because mm. I was alone. There was yeah. no one else who was coming from Uganda. I'd not gone through airport security before. And there's a way they, they, can, they can sense it. They'll push you around and, and they'll know that it's your first time. Mm. Yeah, but I tried. I mean, 
Yeah, I tried. I, I um, got you to made fly. It. Yeah, you can, <laughs> I mean, we are here. Um, <laughs> so I got on a plane at around 11.30 in the morning mm-hmm. and I reached Prague. Mm-hmm. I reached Dubai. Dubai. I don't, I like Dubai, the city, but I don't like Dubai airport. It's mm-hmm. not fair for first time travelers. <laughs> it's, it's not really fair. Like, like it's too big. Yeah, it's big. too big and... If it's your first time, I think you need someone who, I mean, if if there's a service that they can put for people <laughs> to get helped around because you have to use a lot of brain power. Yeah, I got to Dubai at around six. I got to Dubai at 5.30. You almost missed your connecting flight. Yeah, my yeah, I got to Dubai at 5.30. My, my connecting flight was supposed to depart at 6.30. Ooh. I arrived That's in nice. a different... Terminal, Terminal yeah. 2. So I had to cross from Terminal 2 to Terminal 1. That's where I was supposed to check in, not even board. I had to first check in because it was a physical check in. In one hour. Hmm. In one hour. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I did not know that one hour is so short a time to do all this because I had not flown before. So <laughs> in Terminal 2, they told me, yo, you have to wait for a bus. It's like 15 minutes. Mm, okay, I'm like, I'm on time. I have one hour. <laughs> I sit. The bus comes. So I get to the counter where I'm supposed to check in in Terminal 1. There's an Indian lady. Oh, my God. That lady was so furious. She's like, you want to do what? <laughs> People are on the plane and you want to check in. Uh, and I mean, I tried to. I mean, she was a good lady, but she was furious at how late I was. I mean, I would too because... The boarding time was four, mm. four to five, four to five thirty. I arrived at six. Oh, People right. were boarding as I was trying to check in. So she like first got furious with me, called the supervisor. I was lucky that the supervisor was Nigerian. All oh, right. So there was like, no, 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 let's let's try. Let's try. Don't don't get your hopes up yet, but let's try. So they made the call to the airline and the airline was like, yeah, book him in. So all that took like 20 to 30 minutes. So, I mean, I, I had my phone all the way. So at exactly six, about 6.10, I had my boarding visa, my boarding pass. And I had to run, for those who know the airport, Terminal 1, D3. It's mm-hmm. very far from the check-in place. I ran all the way. Like I was the only, like people were looking at me like, <laughs> what's, what's wrong with this young African running around the airport? Yeah, so the lady gave me the boarding pass and said, run. <laughs> Just run. Uh, the middle turn to the corner. I ran. The good thing I'm, I'm used to running, so it didn't. <laughs> yeah, but when I got there, they had already removed the, the passage that gets into oh, the tunnel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the tunnel. And <clears throat> when I reached, like I could stand, the person who was moving it could see me. So they moved it back. I don't know why they moved it. I found out when I was getting into the plane that the person who actually works on that is from my country. Because uh-huh. he had seen I was holding my visa and it's like a, a unique color. You're it's Ugandan. Ugandan, Ugandan yeah. yeah. So. Ugandan. I mean, uh, I got to find out when he said he greeted me in our local language, the common local language. I was like, this is, I have to get to Prague because (laughs) it's a lot of people's efforts. So I boarded the plane and like everyone was settled, seatbelts on and, and they were ready to like start moving. And I got in and everyone was looking. I, I got, I don't know if people have ever seen business class. I go to see the people who sit in business class because they usually enter last. I passed in, <laughs> in front of the plane, so I got to see those guys. I broke airline rules, I think. <laughs> yeah, so I got in and sat. And I arrived here at around past midnight, about a half past midnight. Mm-hmm. I had not booked a hotel because, uh, yeah. Right. This guy is a superhero. So he told me... <coughs> this, it's not just me, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm bringing so, Fernando. So you arrived uh, after midnight, so it was Thursday already. And yeah, I arrived, I, arrived, yeah. I arrived on Thursday. The first day of the conference. That's so you arrived it. in Prague after midnight, no hotel. So yeah, what happened then? 
So, <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, Come on, I'll have a story. <laughs> I mean, I'll, 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 I'll be sure to tell it forward. So when I arrived at the airport, Herman had uh, contacted Fernando of uh, Bitcoin Beach, Brazil. And Fernando had a couch. <laughs> What's better than a couch when you don't have where to stay? So when I got to the airport, uh, Herman put me in touch with Fernando. Fernando is like, so if you can come, this is the address, please. There's a couch here. I'm like, okay, so I have to get, I have to first get to the couch to sleep on it. <laughs> yeah, so I had not used Uber a lot in Uganda. So I connected to the airport Wi-Fi, downloaded Uber, connected my card. So the hundred dollars I deposited on my card, mm. just in case. So I, I used an Uber to the location, and I found Fernando working. I mean, I'd slept all the way, thirteen hours. Slept, woke up, slept, woke up. So I was fresh. We did some work up to around five. We slept yeah. for, yeah, we slept for two hours, three, and we went to the conference. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, Welcome to Prague. <laughs> thank you very much. I mean, I, 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 I'm I very sure Prague will stay dear to me because the... You won't forget that. Yeah, I can't forget. <laughs> I mean, the city delivered, like, for all the work it took to get here, it's really a beautiful city. The conference was... I mean, if all Bitcoin conferences are like this... No, they're not all this good. <laughs> <laughs> we have to figure out a way to get to all of them. But it was really a great experience. Got to learn a lot. A lot. <clears throat> I mean, I can tell this story up to to when we finish the podcast, yeah. <laughs> but but the conference was great for for a person who has been, I would say, I've not met this many Bitcoiners who understand Bitcoin who have the same passion I share for Bitcoin in the same place. The most I've had is 10. 10, 10 people, yeah. a meetup, small meetup, talking about Bitcoin. <clears throat> and you get into this place and there's, there's someone who is not only passionate about Bitcoin, but community building, mining, self-custody. There's someone who is uh, careers, leadership. Mm -hmm. like this, is, this is all these aspects that now take their own form in the conference and then you start to find where you belong. So I ended up on the circular economies booth, which I want to to try to do because I've I've been trying to educate, but I'd not been introduced to the idea of creating a circular economy. And it's something that works when, when you get to deep dig deep in and read, mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense. Cool, cool. I would like to stay for a while on the topic of getting to Prague mm -hmm. because I believe for Herman it wasn't easy as well, right? You know, like the passport of South Africans isn't like that <laughs> useful and uh, getting a visa also takes some effort. Yeah. No, the South African passport is not great. I mean, my, my effort was a little bit more... Um, how could I say, accommodating, and Brendan's, I had more time to plan. Um, I, I had to travel to a, a different city to, to get the visa, but uh, again, not, not as difficult as that. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I live in a small town in South Africa, relatively, so there's, there's two consulates in the country, so I had to travel a couple of hours, stay overnight, apply for the visa. But I mean, I had several weeks to plan this. I, I knew right. further in advance that I would be going. But yeah, the South African passport isn't great, obviously. Um, it's also not improving. <laughs> it's sliding <laughs> down the ranks. Um, so yeah, I know you've got to get a visa um, and it's, it's quite a mission. Right. So maybe uh, let's now uh, introduce you a little bit more in terms of what you do. So with Herman, please uh, describe your project, Bitcoin Akasi. What is it about? Yeah, sure, man. I mean, Brendan mentioned the circular economy booth, uh, but this is essentially why I came to the conference. The The organizers asked me to to put up a circular economy booth because the project that the project that I founded and, and manage is a circular economy project. Um, it's based on a pre-existing organization. Um, I've been essentially been doing uh, work with that organization since 2010. 
Um, it's a youth empowerment organization, and we teach kids how to live better lives. It's the Surfer Kids. Yeah, it's called called the Surfer Kids. Um, it's always been centered around surfing. You know, that was the one thing I was relatively good at. So I felt it could be a useful tool to, you know, teach kids who live in very difficult circumstances a potential way to um, to change their lives. I mean, surfing teaches commitment and you need commitment to to do whatever you want to do, as, you know, as is evidenced by, by Brendan's story, you know, it's commitment that carried him through to Prague at the end of the day. Um, they, they, there's many instances when one can give up, but it's when you push through that and keep going despite wanting to give up that you you end up changing your life. So that's what we've been trying to do since, since 2010. Um, I in fact then got to a point in 2020 where I wanted to give up uh, because it's been it, it had been more than a decade by then, and I just I, I felt I couldn't do this anymore um, because I wasn't making any progress. Uh, I wasn't having the effect I was hoping I could have, and I felt like my energy and my time was just being wasted. Um, luckily, again, I I I wasn't given the opportunity to give up. It just wasn't an option. And a year later, we decided to flip the whole organization onto a Bitcoin standard. And this is essentially when Bitcoin Ikasi was born. It's still the same organization as before. We're still doing exactly the same work. We work with children from very poor areas, recruit them into the program, teach them how to become better. Um, the only difference is now we are paying salaries to the staff that run this organization in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And because they're earning 100% of their salaries in Bitcoin, they then go out into the community and onboard shops to accept Bitcoin as payment. Um, and both the shop owners and the coaches are also saving in Bitcoin. So they're using it as a daily form of money, um, buying stuff that they need to buy, but also saving in Bitcoin, which I think is, you know, the best way to try and change your life plan for the future and Bitcoin is a fantastic tool to do that. Right. And in terms of where uh, the Bitcoin Akasi project is located, it's a township, right? And I yeah. don't, uh, I'm not sure if people like outside of South Africa understand the term, the township. Yeah. I mean, a township is essentially a slum. Um, it's a little different in the sense that, um, you know, I mean, I've, I've, I've traveled to many countries around the world and I've encountered poverty in many, many different places. South African townships is is not unique in the sense of poverty. There's extreme poverty, but there's extreme poverty in many places around the world. What makes a township in South Africa different um, goes back to the previous regime where there was this extreme separation between white people and everyone else. Um, there was, in fact, many different levels of separation. The government classified up to eight different races. So you'd be either white, Indian, Chinese. I mean, they even separate the Chinese and Japanese in two different categories. Um, the category right at the bottom was black African. Um, and so your, your, your list of privileges and rights decreased on the way down. Mm. And so the township is a remnant of that because one of these separations specified that this is the infamous Group Areas Act which is one of the most repressive apartheid laws that was brought into force in 1960 um, and was in force until 1990. So for 30 years, um, people from different races were not allowed to live within the same geographic areas. And as a result of that, what ended up happening was non-white people could work in the city, but they were not allowed to live in the city. They had to live in locations, which is often kilometers outside the city center located in pretty shitty places. And our project is called Bitcoin Ikasi. And the word Ikasi actually refers to that location because it's derived from the word location in Afrikaans, which is Lukasi. And Lukasi becomes Ikasi. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a word that is now these days only used by people who live in the township itself to refer to the place where they live. So it's, it's almost become a, I wouldn't say a positive word, but it's, 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 you know, it, it refers to the fact that in the township, because people live on top of each other, life happens outside on the street. You know, so if your neighbor is slaughtering a chicken, then you know about it. Right. You know, if he's listening to music, then you know about it because everybody lives lives in such close proximity. Um, it's a very common word. You'll see, you know, you drive into a township, you'll see Ekasi, Ekasi barber shop or Ekasi this. It's a very common word, but it's only used by people who live in the township right. itself. Right. So what's... Um 
What has been the adoption of merchants uh, in Bitcoin Akasi in, in the township so far and uh, how are they responding to accepting Bitcoin? I mean, they respond pretty positively once once it's demonstrated to them that Bitcoin is actual money. So once you've demonstrated that you can easily convert it to real world goods and services, um, one of the most useful services in this regard has been Bitrefill since the beginning because you can literally buy phone credits within an instant. Um, once once that's done, then it's it's adopted um, pretty positively because it solves uh, an immediate problem, which is access to digital payments. Um, you know, cash is great, but not if cash is your only option. If cash is your only option, then it's pretty bad. Yeah. It's very limiting in the way in what you can do. Um, because it's you know completely reliant on your physical proximity to wherever you want to send your value to. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's it's pretty positive. I mean, look, we're not pushing adoption aggressively. We're basically we're, we'll we'll adopt another we'll, we'll onboard another shop if we employ another person. Mm -hmm. So for every salary that we create, for every new salary we create, every new position we create, we're paying another salary in Bitcoin. We'll onboard another shop. Because we kind of want to make sure that the shops we do on board, there's, you know, sats are being spent spent there on a daily basis. So we have 11 people earning salaries in Bitcoin, and we've got 15 or 16 merchants accepting Bitcoin as payment. Mm -hmm. And I think those two will probably grow together until until there's a wider interest from the rest of the community. That will probably remain the case. Yeah. And you're also recently employing a professional teacher. Uh, what's the curriculum and uh, like who are her students? Uh, yeah, we've, we, she started with us in September last year, but the first few months it, it was just intensive training. She comes from a professional teaching background. She taught at a South African government school as a primary school teacher, uh, but she has she's never been involved in Bitcoin in any way whatsoever. The important thing is that she's from within the community. Um, so when we were recruiting, I realized that it would be either getting somebody with a professional teaching background who knew Bitcoin, but not from the community, or it would be a case where we get someone from the community with a professional teaching background, but know nothing about Bitcoin. And I think that was the better option. It's easier to teach someone Bitcoin than what it is to localize them within the community. Uh, you need that inside knowledge, I think, to to break through to to your students. So she she essentially runs a a Bitcoin educational center. She has five classes a week um, from Monday to Friday. Uh, those classes at the moment, all of them run after school because we only have uh, young children recruited in the program so far. Essentially, we've only got the children who already participated in the Surfer Kids program that mm. attend these classes, but we are going to start moving over to adult classes. There's massive unemployment. I mean, South Africa has an unemployment rate of 35%, which is really high. In the township, it's even higher. So there's lots of people who are available during the day with nothing to do. And those are the people we want to pull in and teach about Bitcoin. Um, we have one morning class so far that's started, but that's for our own staff. And for the curriculum, we are using Mi Primer Bitcoin, my first Bitcoin. Uh, we're using the Bitcoin diploma, which was created by them or curated by them rather, mm -hmm. um, and then translated to English. Um, I'm super grateful for that because, you know, from September until around about January this year, we we essentially learned that you don't just make up a Bitcoin curriculum. <laughs> That's yes. not something that you that you do like this. It's uh, There's lots of information out there and there's lots of good quality information out there, but compiling it into something that's coherent and makes sense is, 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 is a difficult task. So, And the Bitcoin Diploma, I've been told, is a, is a very good very good resource for, for first-time learners as an introduction. So that's that's what we're using at the moment. Cool. So for uh, for you, Brendan, what are your Bitcoin related activities in Uganda? <coughs> I and mean, maybe maybe first, please tell me, uh, are you from the capital city of Uganda or where are you from in, uh, in the country? So originally I'm from out of the capital city. I'd come to attend my university, which I completed recently. So I've been uh, staying in the city because right. that's where I'm used to living for now. 
So what what goes on Bitcoin related is not so much activity, though we've um, we've done a couple of meetups, five to seven Bitcoin meetups, and um, I've seen the community slowly grow, <clears throat> not only to adopt Bitcoin but to also get new people to pick interest in Bitcoin because. In Uganda, we have a lot of crypto marketing projects, scams that come around disguising to be crypt, to be to be Bitcoin even sometimes. So people know about Bitcoin; they've they have a scanty, sketchy idea about it. But <clears throat> uh, the most role that we have to play is teach them what really Bitcoin is and how it empowers them. So meetups mainly. We've um, celebrated Bitcoin Pizza Day twice. Mm-hmm. starting last year and this year and then um we've also had a couple of vendors accept bitcoin the first time we did that was uh when we had pako over pako so, in india yeah he pako, was in uganda yeah oh. he was in uganda and we hosted him at that point we were <clears throat> we were still i think in university final hours so we we hosted him and the place at which we hosted him we orange peeled the place beforehand so i got to go and talk to the owner of the restaurant and talk to him about bitcoin i explained to him i told him if he accepted bitcoin would be having a meet up there and we had about 30 to 40 people who turned up and they all paid in bitcoin so it was exciting but um all in all we've had about 6 to 7 vendors who have accepted bitcoin two have dropped off because of something that i came to learn when I, i came to prague that it's very easy to onboard vendors and that's why we're having that much success it's uh, not so easy to get people to spend right. bitcoin because what keeps a vendor accepting bitcoin is them receiving a person who wants to pay with bitcoin maybe once at least once a week so what would happen is in these meetups we would pay them with bitcoin they would receive bitcoin they would uh, uh, liquidate it if they want there's a one, there's one who decided to hold about 10% of it and it fluctuated and they sold it so what what keeps a vendor in tune is when they have someone who spends bitcoin at least on a daily basis and then uh, on a large scale we have bit devs Uh, mm-hmm. there's bit devs kampala we've had two meetups so far i've been to all of them and very fantastic starting discussions in the in the end of how do you develop in bitcoin how do you because the idea is when you have more local bitcoin developers then they can solve access problems to bitcoin they can implement bitcoin in local ways so there's that and then there's also the bitcoin innovation hub which is uh, starting out run by Meron Stefanos. Stefanos. Yeah, yeah. I I'm I'm highly excited for that one. It's going to help a lot because still it's also targeting innovators. So when you have a lot of innovation on Bitcoin, it means you're bringing local use case. Mm-hmm. And uh, in turn that um, sparks more adoption. Right. So I'm curious about what's uh, the situation like uh, with uh, Bitcoin infrastructure in the country. I mean like ATMs, exchanges, stuff like that. Is it uh, allowed? Is it banned? Uh, how does it work? So previously you were able to buy Bitcoin off of uh, the major exchanges that we know in the world. Binance is there, there's uh, Luno, there's there was FTX. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah no offense sbf wherever you are <laughs> yeah there was ftx and uh yellow card uh, mm-hmm. most of these exchanges are there what kills me is that the bitcoin only exchanges are not yet there where uh, we'll see and the bitcoin only wallets so most people have to buy bitcoin from these uh no my exchanges but what happened recently is there was a scam that was using crypto in general to scam people and they would buy their bitcoin through mobile money i'm very sure people are familiar with mobile money so the idea was they were disguising to be crypto that that is backed by gold and something <laughs> the usual kind of uh, scams that are propagated and 
the government took a stance and said all mobile money service providers should not interact with any crypto company. So that means uh, right now, if you're to buy Bitcoin, you have to buy it using bank, mm-hmm. which creates an access problem because even bank accounts are like scarce in the country. Most people who have bank accounts are above 25 years old. Right. So it's not like something that everyone gets. And um, also maintaining a bank account in Uganda is very hard because they are quite expensive. You have a lot of fees on there. So <sighs> the situation access is very hard. There are no Bitcoin ATMs that I know of. Mm-hmm. Um we have I think an Azteco reseller who sells in Uganda but is based in Nairobi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not Nairobi, Mombasa I think, so neighboring country. So the the activities we are doing are like we're trying to to trigger that kind of uh Bitcoin activity. Right. Yeah. And in terms of um like the general situation in Uganda uh, in terms of uh, political situation and also uh, the currency. Is there a high inflation? Are there currency controls? Like what's, what does it look like? In I mean, what, what will be interesting for the viewers and the listeners is, <clears throat> I don't know in how many countries it happens, but when I'm paying someone in Uganda shillings, I can calculate it in Bitcoin because my country has a parity with sats <laughs> so one so uganda one shilling yeah one, one uganda sat. shilling is one sat equivalent <laughs> i think right now it's more because bitcoin price is at 25 the parity happens at about 26500 right yeah so right now one sat is more than one uganda shilling it's quite interesting because uh then that means it's easier for people to understand bitcoin because the most vendors we onboarded was during that period <laughs> we're like yeah like it's the normal you just have to use it in bitcoin so the 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 presence of such should tell you that the country's currency is like it's dead because there was a month where we were buying soap at 3000 Ugandan shillings and within like two weeks it was twice the price it was actually more than twice because it was 7500 mm. that doesn't happen to a currency that is in good condition yeah. a lot of things get expensive quite fast you will pay rent 300000 this month and uh, your landlord will give you a notice Next month we are raising it to 400 because they can't afford to keep the the place running to pay for the mm. utilities and what. So the cost of living is changing drastically because the government is uh, constantly trying to preserve itself in power. So I've not seen a different president ever since I was born. My president yeah. has been in power since 1986. That means Jesus. technically my father was uh, about three, four years old. My late father was three, four years old when he came into power. Right. That makes a lot of systems very inactive. They don't work. A lot of things don't work in the country. Mm. But the things that are available are mostly natural resources. People will have food. Food is abundant. The climate is great. There's a lot of tourism so if if you are a Ugandan and you you know how to survive you will survive but the government in itself is so so consumed in keeping itself in power than it is mm. looking after its people so that's a good um breeding ground from for bitcoin adoption I yeah. believe so because a lot of people understand they feel it When you talk about inflation everyone feels it it's not like something new when you talk about government printing they all feel it because uh during elections we have a lot of money uh, that that is printed that is released and this makes it easy for the normal person to feel like they are being constantly taken advantage of because what was worth what you were paid last month my not sustain you next month and for that case even the pay is not so great because we don't have a minimum wage so you're already earning peanuts and then the peanuts are becoming 
Yeah, they are oh, being goodness. inflated away. So <laughs> most of the times it's, <laughs> it's very easy to talk to people and they will get inflation on the go. And the advantage I also have teaching people about Bitcoin is because mobile money in a sort is already like Bitcoin because it's mostly digital. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so people are used to sending and receiving money. And uh, it's not so scary. The part of sending and receiving Bitcoin is not so scary because they are used. Yeah. So it's just putting in the work to let them know that this is a solution that works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in terms of uh, educational resources in Uganda, so the uh, so the official language is English, yes, right? Please. So you can uh, access all the English-speaking podcasts, books, yes. and stuff like that. That's- yeah, but the thing that we we've tried to do is uh, we are organizing our websites to have some of these things that will push the community to easily learn on their own, because most of the podcasts are in English. Uh, we are trying to create a platform where someone can buy most of the Bitcoin resources. Could be a book, could be a hardware wallet, could be whatever they need. Maybe a match uh, shirts to to teach someone about Bitcoin because when you put on a shirt, you trigger someone else to pay attention. So the the resources are available. I mean, it's it's uh, we are in the early days of our work. So mm. some of the resources have worked. We've uh, created a Bitcoin only group. We have a lot of crypto groups, but when you identify that one person who who is understanding Bitcoin only, you will bring them to this side and mm-hmm. and uh, work with them more to like get more in because it's um you have to meet people where they are and bring them where you want them to be. Mm. So that's that's what we do. Right. And you also mentioned uh, your university studies. So what did you study? I studied uh, a bachelor's in Chinese and Asian studies. So if you have a Chinese uh, listener, right. they will translate and send it in the comments. <laughs> yeah, so I do speak Chinese um, enough to get me by. I, I listen quite well. I could hear most of what they say. And... Also, the culture that I get to learn from the the Chinese part of the world, the Asian part of the world, has helped me quite a lot because they are hardworking people. They are more efficient in in the way they they spend their resources and in the way they live. So, it was a great three years at, uh, at the university. Right, and so Chinese is uh, useful in uh, like a country like uh, Uganda, right? Because there's a lot of uh, foreign investment. I, I mean, the foreign investment, rather foreign debt. Mm. Yeah, it's not investment. <laughs> it's a lie. No, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's foreign loan. Yeah, like they will bring in just loans that will be paid by our children mm. or using our resources. We We have to take, we have to choose. So... Uh, my country has a lot of Chinese, not different from any part of Africa. And um, Chinese have a difficult time adjusting to the whole English uh, idea of uh, the country. So it's very easy for a person who speaks their language, speaks a bit of the local languages and English to to mediate business. Mm. It uh, makes it a bit simpler because, I mean, I mean they... They work just fine. There are projects that have run and I know of where no one was speaking English. It was just sign language, demonstrations. But when you have a person who understands the language, it becomes easier, it becomes simpler. And the Chinese have identified this because that's why they pushed our course. A lot of uh, local local Chinese companies were, mm-hmm. were supporting the course a lot. We were the first lot. I think in Africa they've not rolled the course out anywhere else, so the course is uh, pushed mostly by um, the Confucius Institute, which is um, a school of thought that is uh, very big in China. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And uh, if you don't mind me asking, in terms of um, what you do, Bitcoin is still just a hobby for you, right? Or like, like a passion? It's not your job. I mean, uh, it was about a month. Oh, four weeks, I mean, three weeks ago, when I posted anyone who has a Bitcoin job, I really need to get one because it gets boring when 
all you hear is Bitcoin, all you read is Bitcoin and then you get back to work and people are like, oh, when is salary coming? And you wish that was in Bitcoin. So mm-hmm. I do not, uh, I only still engage in Bitcoin because of my passion. But um, I have local, they're not even, it's not a full-time job. It's uh, a job on demand. Yeah, so it's, um, that's where I still stand. I mean, I wanted to work with Chinese, but the Chinese take me away from, the Chinese companies that I'm in touch with, they take me away from Bitcoin. And I discovered, I got into Bitcoin so much after starting on Chinese. Mm. And um, I mean, I would rather stay in Bitcoin. So yeah, that's it. Cool. Um, So in terms of uh, the realities of South Africa, uh, the country itself is sort of falling apart right so if uh, or if you don't mind me saying <laughs> that's like my impression from what i've heard so herman uh yeah give us a glimpse into what's happening in the country uh in general yeah i mean yeah if if you if you look at where the country could have been by now um had the last 30 years been handled better then yeah it's fair to say it's falling apart um unfortunately corruption corruption has has caused the country to 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 fall to fall apart to go backwards i mean we have massive issues with electricity um it's it's pretty normal to have anywhere between six to ten hours of um power cuts per day some days it's maybe two to four hours but average anything between four to eight hours and on really bad days it goes up to 10 to 12 hours a day mm. of of power cuts and this is this essentially comes down to the fact that the national electricity uh provider is it's a it's a, it's a state-owned monopoly um and corruption has caused all of the investment or not all of it but too much of it um over the past 30 years to go into the pockets of corrupt politicians rather than going into the building of power stations and so the country is increasingly relying on old power stations to 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 keep up to a growing demand these stations have to be serviced they units break down they're being pushed to their you know to the to the rim of their capacity and they're still not keeping up to demand new stations are delayed um they are constructed with defects and this is essentially all because of extreme corruption mm. um so yeah and, and that's just just one example there are other examples the national airline same story um the education system it's it's also not not doing well um not enough schools are being built um again you know money is lining the pockets of politicians rather than so it's it's an unfortunate situation. Uh, the country was filled with hope after the first democratic elections in 1994. I mean, I'm I'm old enough to remember that. I was a, a young teenager when when that happened, um, and and I clearly remember that. And the years following that was, you know, everyone was hopeful. Everyone thought the country would fall into chaos and civil war, and that didn't happen. And uh, it's sort of a shining example of hope for the rest of the world. Um, but that didn't last very long. You know, mm-hmm. After about 10 years, I'd say from, from the mid 2000s onwards. So essentially the last 20 years, things have been going down steadily um, at an accelerating pace. Um, right, what's the situation like with the currency? Uh, the currency has lost a lot of value, but it's happened very gradually. So when, again, when I was a kid, I'm, I'm old enough to remember in the early nineties, uh, the South African Rand was almost at parity to the dollar, not quite, but almost, it was like between two and three Rand for $1. And today it's almost 20 Rand for $1. So I think the currency has lost, uh, between 80, 80, 85% of its value against the dollar. In 20 uh, years. Yeah, 20, 25 years, yeah. give or take. I mean, over the course of a of a generation, that's con- a considerable devaluation. It's, it doesn't happen overnight, but 
you know, it's definitely been noticeable. Um, the first time I traveled overseas when, when I was 15, which was in 2002, uh, it was, it was less than 10 Rand for a dollar. So, and today it's almost double, mm. um, you know, so it's, yeah. <laughs> not great. <laughs> right. Plus there's capit uh, currency controls, right? You cannot freely exchange uh, the rent to no. dollars. No, it's so very, sure. very strict capital controls. Uh, it's funny because the, oh, well, I guess these things are not funny, but you know, you've <laughs> got to look at it from, from that perspective. Um, but it, it's, it's sort of ironic. That's a better word. Uh, that the, the previous regime, the apartheid regime was completely isolated from the rest of the world. Uh, very similar to sort of say communist Russia where nothing came in and nothing went out. South Africa had a very similar situation. Nothing came in, nothing went out mm. culturally, financially, et cetera. Um, it, extremely isolated, very strict capital controls. And these capital controls were inherited by the current regime and they've kept them in place, but for different reasons. So both governments, the apartheid government, uh, the former apartheid government were paranoid about um, uh, capital flight. So, you know, money leaving leaving the currency and the currency devaluing. Um, and the current government is also uh, paranoid about capital flight. And so they've kept the same capital control controls in place. They're paranoid for different reasons. And they're two completely different governments. Mm. But, you know, uh, same problem. <laughs> but you can exchange uh, the rent uh, for Bitcoin, right? Yeah, How yeah. easy is that? No, that's relatively easy. Um, the, the, the situation is sort of somewhere between um, ignorant and neutral, I would say. Um, like the government stands toward Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The government, from, from, from a government perspective, I would say they either, they, they either still grappling with what it is and figuring out how to regulate it, or they sort of, the, the regulations that have been, have been passed are, are pretty neutral. So not negative in any way, but also not particularly positive. Uh, they are trying to regulate it or they have said that they're going to regulate it as an asset, um, for, for capital gains taxes, um, et, et cetera. So yeah, you can easily exchange the rand for, for Bitcoin and, and vice versa. Um, there are some regulated exchanges in the country, mm -hmm. um, large exchanges. Right. And also recently you had that uh, pick and pay integration, right? So you can yeah. spend Bitcoin at a large retail chain. So tell us more about that. Yeah. Pick and pay is uh, pick and pay is if it, if it's not the biggest, uh, retail chain store, then it's definitely one of the top three. So it, it's a massive retail chain store. There's more than a thousand five hundred outlets countrywide. Um, it's a, it's the, the brand encompasses a, a grocery store, uh, a grocery store chain, a clothing store chain and a liquor store in South Africa. Alcohol is sold separately from normal groceries. You don't buy them that in the same shop. You need a yeah. special liquor license. So that's, you know, they, so they sell a, a liquor store, a clothing and, and, and groceries and the grocery stores, the pick and bake grocery stores are big, so really big grocery stores sort of sort of like the Walmart of South Africa type mm -hmm. of thing. And uh, a local startup company by the name of Crypto Convert um, uh, built this integration, which is essentially a little bridging app. Um, and what it does is you, you install the app, um, you link it to your Lightning wallet with a small little test payment. And then you walk into the grocery store and all these stores have credit card terminals with a very low resolution screen on that low, low resolution screen. There's a QR code, which can be scanned by other financial uh, FinTech apps. Uh, you can also scan that with your regular banking banking app. So if you don't have your credit card or your debit card, then you can use your banking app to scan that code and then pay that way. What crypto converted has done. They've built a system that takes that QR code and turns it into a lightning invoice. Uh, you pay then you then scan that QR code, pay the lightning invoice from your lightning wallet and crypto converted then gives the company in this, in this case, pick and pay the option to either take that payment in sats or they then convert it on behalf of them into fiat and then accept the payment in fiat. Mm -hmm. And so the second customer they onboarded, which is a pizza 
pizza chain. I mean, it has to be pizza, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Which is a, a, a chain of pizza, pizza restaurants in Cape Town. They've actually opted to then now take payment in SATs. So they're not even converting that payment to fiat anymore. And I mean, in my fairly limited experience, I think this is a massive, massive adoption story that the Bitcoin space has kind of missed to, to some extent. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's huge. It's a thousand five hundred stores in a country with, in a country of 60 million people where you can walk in and, and it's as close to a straight up Bitcoin payment as mm. you can get. I mean, it's nice that the, um, the retail chain still has the opportunity uh, or the option to keep some of it in sets. I don't know if they do, but, uh, it, has that option, right? The integration. Yeah, I mean, look, what one would have to talk to crypto converted to to Cardle. He's the, um, the the founder of the company to 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 know the specifics. But as far, I mean, we were uh, our project was quite intimately involved in the testing phase of this. So they they did testing for about five months before announcing anything publicly. And and the pick and pay in in the town where we are based, which is Mossel Bay, was one of the test sites and because they knew there would be a bunch of people already earning salaries in Bitcoin. So they knew they would get a lot of test payments. Um, mm. I believe that pick and pay is still at the top in terms of rankings. That that's the pick and pay that gets more sats than any other pick and pay in the country for obvious reasons, because there's you know 11 people earning their salaries in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. but, so we were quite intimately involved in testing, but I don't have all the specifics, but I do know that pick and pay, they are not taking their payments in sats. They are taking it in fiat. Um, the second merchant that they onboarded, which is this pizza chain chain store, um, that's got about 10 or 15 branches across Cape Town, they are taking payment in sats. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I do believe that pick and pay is quite keen to at some point take payment in sats because apparently uh, the primary reason that pick and pay, I mean, pick and pay is doing this specifically because they're interested in Bitcoin. Uh -huh. they, they, they do, they're doing this because it's from a technological perspective, this thing interests them. Right. Um, obviously there's the card payment, um, benefits in terms of fees and so on. But as I, but again, this is, I'm, um, this is, this is information that I get from an outsider's perspective. Um, yeah. And you mentioned that you can actually pay your bills, like electricity bills and buy a plane ticket in the pick and pay as well. So you can yeah. do that for Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, pick and pay, it's it's being such a massive grocery store, the, the big ones at least, I mean, they do have smaller stores also, but the big pick and pay grocery stores, there's at least one in every, um, you know, medium to large town across the country. Some towns have more than one. You can you can pay bills, you can pay municipal bills, you can, you can pay for plane tickets, bus tickets, you can even buy... I believe some of them have theater tickets, you know, it's, it's, they've got a kiosk there where you can buy prepaid electricity. Um, you can do pretty much everything at pick and pay. So. Yeah. Right. So, um, it's definitely, um, worth mentioning that people sh like in the Western world should take more attention what's happening in South Africa with pick and pay, but also with uh, stuff like Machankura. Yeah. And I believe the Machankura founder, he's your friend, like he's from South Africa as yeah. well. So if you could describe he's a cool guy. That, uh, the project uh, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, Machankura is another is another project in South Africa. Um, Machankura is, uh, the founder is Kotatso. Uh, he, he previously, before starting Machankura, ran a project called Exonumia, which is translating Bitcoin material into African languages. Um, He's sort of the coordinator of all these different translators that take material and, and tra translate what they can. Uh, he started Machankura, I think it's been about a year. Um, and essentially it's a lightning, a Bitcoin lightning wallet that runs on the USSD network, which is the same network that um, cell phone carriers use to send SMSs. Mm -hmm. You're essentially interacting with a, a, a Bitcoin, a custodial, Bitcoin wallet, and you're interacting with that wallet by sending interactive SMSs back and forth, mm. which means that you don't need internet to do that, and you don't need data to do that. As long as you have an active cell phone connection to a cell phone network, then you can interact with this custodial lightning wallet, which also means you can do it on an old phone. You know, these feature phones with the, the low resolution green screens where you used to play Snake. 
Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, so, what uh, do you know? Like, what's the proportion of uh, these mobile phones, these feature phones, in the country? Um, there's 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 a surprisingly large amount of them. They still sell them, actually. Mm. So, the cheapest phone that you can buy uh, retails for about sure 180 rand. That's what's that in euros divided by ten. Um, about 10 euros, mm -hmm. less than 10 euros, eight, nine, eight, eight or nine euros. So you can buy a phone for eight or nine euros. Um, the SIM card costs next to nothing. And, and then you've got access to a custodial lightning wallet. It is obviously custodial. There's no way of doing this in a self custody way yet. As far as I know, um, I've heard Kotatsu talk about ways of encrypting private keys on a SIM card, but I, I know how that would work. Um, mm. But yeah, it's a very exciting project. I mean, we, we use it quite extensively um, in the township. Obviously, we have lots of people. Look, the thing about this wallet is it's not only for old feature phones because a lot of, of low-end smartphones, you've got the color screen, you've got the touch screen, you can download apps, but these phones are so low in memory that somebody with Facebook on their phone, if they've got Facebook and WhatsApp, that's it. They don't have any more space. So now you want to onboard them. Mm. You've got to download a wallet first but then you got to start deleting apps. The great thing about Machankura is, yes, it's custodial, but you don't have to download anything. You have a instant lightning wallet on your phone without using any extra available memory on the phone. Right. So, Brendan, I'm curious about uh, if the feature phones are also so prevalent in Uganda, and uh, I don't know if Machankura actually works in your country. I mean, yeah, the biggest population holds those feature phones. I mean, I held a feature phone up until... I was going to university. Uh -huh. So yeah, they, they, are, they are quite common. Uh, mobile money flourishes on the USSD nature of, uh, of uh, the feature phones. Mm. And um, uh, when it comes to Machankura, Machankura was very, I mean, Uganda we were among the first countries okay. to roll out Machankura. But what happened is uh, the same... Um, document that was released by the government stopping mobile money services providers dealing with crypto uh, i think in a way affected uh, the way machankura was working so in uganda you can only now use machankura using the web version which cuts out the feature phone guys right. but um, it, it's actually something that we tested we worked with we're using it since sats back and forth i mean there's a time we had a meetup and someone in germany donated sats and we received them on a feature phone so mm -hmm. yeah it, it works <laughs> it, it works great actually mm -hmm. yeah right um i'd like to point the listeners to one great youtube video it's called the silent bitcoin revolution of africa which uh it was uh, in a great part recorded at Bitcoin Akasi, right? Yeah. And it uh, covers Bitcoin Akasi, Machankua, and the Bit Pick and Pay uh, integration. It's just a couple of minutes long, but it's very well, very well done. So uh, I believe like that could that should have uh, also get more attention. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, yeah. great one. Are there any other like resources uh, connected to like uh, Bitcoin in Africa that you would recommend? Um, I mean. <laughs> This is just something that people have mentioned to me, but we, we, we've we made quite a few um, very little, sh short little video clips of just showing everyday usage of Bitcoin in the township. And uh, we, we upload them to Twitter, but then also to YouTube uh, because they get lost on Twitter. So it's, it's a, YouTube is a better place to sort of catalog, catalog them. Mm. And I, I mean, I, I sort of did this because I wanted to have a collection of all the videos, but people have told me that it's quite useful in, in demonstrating the, the usefulness and the everyday usability of Bitcoin when you see people. And I mean, there's, 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 there's so many of these videos that it's pretty clear that it's not a, you know, it's not an isolated occurrence. This is happening on a daily basis. So we try and try and do that. And it's quite, quite, I think it's quite a useful, useful resource, short little videos showing people just you know, using it. Right. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of great content, uh, podcasts, Twitter spaces, I think has done a lot for, for the African continent. There's a lot of great Twitter spaces happening. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know if Brendan, can you think of anything else? Yeah. I mean, there's, um, a website called African Bitcoiners. It tries to, 
to keep a detailed how to reach most projects that are best in Africa. Mm-hmm. It has on there a lot of uh, how to reach Bitcoin ecosy, how to reach the community, the communities that are alive on the continent. You'll most definitely find some content there. And it's so uh, crucial that it also has learning materials for like beginners and it has a lot of Bitcoin resources most good podcasts you'll find them listed uh, you'll find them listed there so that's that's a one go to place for anyone who wants to understand about uh, bitcoin in africa there's also the I've, i've been watching closely the the africa bitcoin conference website it's also getting populated with a lot of what is going on in africa mm-hmm. and um, then when you come to youtube YouTube there's not much from my end but there's a, a very bold master guantai who is yeah. doing uh, yeah a lot of uh, very nice educational TikTok content he has uh, some videos up there so you can find him on TikTok master guantai and yeah bitcoin dada also has online classes but they that they do for the ladies but those you have to be part of the cohort to access the content mm-hmm. yeah yeah and then there's kwala africa that's for more yeah, for yeah, like yeah, the yeah, yeah, developer yeah, yeah. education yeah thing. that one is uh, <clears throat> mostly developer education then there's also africa free routing they are also trying to spark the node revolution such that more people are, are setting up nodes on the continent that's also a great website to check out <coughs> Yeah, I cool. mean also and Anita Posh does some really interesting things. Yeah, 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 yeah. She um she's done quite a few interesting things in terms of all uh, well, the meetups that she organizes but also the uh, I mean she had this one thing where she was testing lightning wallets in the most remote area you can imagine mm-hmm. um with the wallets connected to her own node sitting in Germany. Things like that which is which is a great um great uh, just again just a, an example of 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 what what is possible and 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 what what isn't possible because mm-hmm. quite often people talk about things but then in reality they don't actually work the way you expect them to work so they were for example on that occasion there were some of the lightning wallets that you know they work well when you've got a great data connection but when you're out in the middle of nowhere then some of them don't actually connect that well and that's also pretty useful to have someone doing those kind of experiments right yeah i will link to all of that thank you Cool. And um in terms of uh, your activities at uh, BTC Prague at the conference did you have any talk uh, workshop uh, so first that and second what what's the takeaway from the conference for you so, uh yeah, maybe Harman first Yeah sure thing I'll 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 start off with that um I mean we yeah so so we had the booth that was the main reason I was here uh, which the organizers asked me to 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 do um i wasn't sure what i would be doing at the conference when i reached out to them uh, but but that came from their side which is a great suggestion i think um and essentially what we were trying to do with the booth was to spark a conversation around i think brendan alluded to this earlier which is you know it's it's one thing to onboard shops um but i think the gist of a circular economy um is really all about onboarding the shops but at the same time encouraging people to spend there on a daily basis and that's that's kind of tricky so there are some interesting projects around around the world um and we tried to take inspiration from some of the most well established projects to come up with a at least try to have a conversation around what are possible blueprints for for doing that um so in our case for example we have this organization that is run by coaches and the coaches earn their salaries in bitcoin and it's because they're earning salaries in bitcoin that they're spending in bitcoin because they don't have to convert from fiat to bitcoin in order to spend but there are other projects that are doing the same thing which is to get the circular economy going but they they have a different blueprint they would tap into the remittance market or they would tap into the expat market or they would use tourism or so that was the that was the idea behind the booth is to to spark a conversation around really making the economy circular which is not just onboarding the shops but actually getting the sats to flow through the shops mm-hmm. um so that was my my main activity at the conference was being at that booth and talking to people about about that um i also did a panel with um with other community builders about building bitcoin communities how do you do that um 
And uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, I met loads of people, fascinating, fascinating experiences and conversations at, at the conference itself. It was a, as far as I'm concerned, definitely, I mean, my limited experiences with conferences, I was surprised by how well organized it was and how high the signal was considering the number of people, because I'm always afraid that if more people come, you bring all the altcoins and crypto and blah, blah, blah with it. Mm. You know, I, I don't want to say it, but shit coins generally tend to come with the masses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <that's true. laughs> so but that didn't really happen here. No. So that, that is what was so not surprising, I guess, but yeah, surprising because that number of people, you know, in my experience, again, my limited experience, uh, that number of people normally that happens. It's kind of like if you want Bitcoin only, you got to have a really small conference. This mm -hmm. was a pretty big conference and it was 99% Bitcoin only. I mean, the expo area where I, I was walking through the expo area, there was maybe one or two booths where I was kind of like, eh, <laughs> you know, but I mean, it was insignificant mm -hmm. compared to the overwhelming majority, which was very high signal. And, and that, go, that goes for the panels and the talks too. Um, so yeah, I mean, very, very impressed by that. Right. Yeah. I have the same impression. Yeah. So Brennan, how did the conference go for you? <clears throat> I mean, I learned, uh, the, the, the major reason I came for the conference was to learn and I did just that. Uh, as Haman speaks, what he doesn't know is I, I, I learned a lot. So <laughs> the past few days I've spent at the booth as he was speaking to people, me, I was also I mean, people would come and look at me as part of the booth, but I'm actually mostly <laughs> part of them just because I'm I'm behind the counter. So I got to learn a lot from uh, both um, Harman and Fernando who are doing something that I want to try and replicate. So the other thing I noticed uh, and I was highly impressed is on the first day of the conference, most of the vendors were not taking Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. By the time we left, the vendor who was not taking Bitcoin was not in business. So there was there was a lot of people who were willing to spend Bitcoin, which is unlike the culture that most people put forward of hodl hodl. So I liked that it became practical for at least the vendors who are on on site to feel that there are actually people who really want to pay with Bitcoin. And if someone was at the, the conference and had not seen or had not realized how powerful it is to make Bitcoin payments, surely they, 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 they got something. And also the diversity in companies that was there. So from hardware companies to movie, film uh, companies to to the setup that differentiates people who are interested in industry, having an expo stage, people who are interested in panels and and uh, keynotes on the other. So the whole setup of the conference was, it was, it was well thought out for each type of Bitcoiner, that there are Bitcoiners who just like the, I mean, there was a very nice uh, piece of work, the robot in the corner. Right. Like, the, the mm. being my first conference, it was, uh, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot of good stuff in one place. Yeah. And all the talks I believe were recorded and will be published later. On yes. That's fantastic, so, yeah. And and for me, that's what is very important because I did not have a chance to get to look at all because then you would be trapped on one side of the fun. Yeah. So I tried to get a bit of all the fun. So I'm, I'm very glad. I think I even started seeing some of them pop up, the, like the one of Michael Saylor. Mm -hmm. And yeah, some of the exciting things, like I've met most of the Bitcoiners online. I've not gotten to, in, I mean, it was my first time to meet Herman, <laughs> but we'd been talking. <laughs> so like the things that, the small things, I got to meet a lot of guys. I got to meet people I met three years ago in Bitcoin right. and we've been in touch. I've been on their posts. They've been on my posts, the interactions. And then you meet these people and they're amazing people. And the fact that even in the place you remove Bitcoin a bit and it's, you're meeting a friend, mm. you're yeah. making a business connection. Someone has an idea connects you to someone else. There's a lot that conferences like this can do. I think 
the one takeaway that I wish if uh, if uh, the organizers uh, get to 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 watch this is in addition to like the nice activities they've done if would have uh, a, a challenge let's call it a challenge where bitcoiners go out and talk to people about bitcoin right like like it sort of happened like i don't know if you know but uh, there was a group of uh, german bitcoiners and they shown a uh, huge Bitcoin logo with the text "Study Bitcoin" yeah, on yeah, the yeah. central I, bank. I was, yeah, that that, <laughs> that 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 is very classic Bitcoin kind. But it I mean, some discussions. Yeah, I mean, I saw people yeah, making sure. effort that uh, we're trying to orange peel their Uber drivers. Right. Like, if we'd make that a bit structured, like we we know along the schedule, we have a part where these three hours, the Bitcoiners who are interested will. Walk out yeah, and, like part of the official schedule. Yeah, it, it would uh, because there's a lot of people who knew about the conference. I've met them around, it's putting on the shirt, but they didn't actually know what it was about. So it would be good to like pick on those people, and you never know where it goes. I mean, we we just orange peeled a lady. Yeah. In the city. Uh, yeah, yeah, taking coffee. <laughs> I, I think it went pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> you just went for a coffee. And I went for a coffee, yeah. Asked if yeah. she accepts Bitcoin. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I just want to give one other shout out too, if that's cool. Yeah. Um, Brendan mentioned Fernando, um, which, I mean, Fernando was the guy that received him yeah. at half past 12 or one o'clock yeah, in the, the morning couch. on the couch the day of the conference, <laughs> which is, you know, pretty epic. Um, Fernando is the is the founder and the 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 person behind uh, Bitcoin Beach in Brazil in Jerry Quaqua, uh, where they've got a fantastic project running there, also a circular Bitcoin economy project. But at this conference, Fernando was also trying to promote um, the Hyper Bitcoinized POS machine, which is a low cost uh, payment terminal. And you know, it, it's it's one of those things where people kind of look at it and go, yeah, I, I don't know if this is actually worth it, but We've used it to some extent uh, in our project. Um, and the really cool thing about it is, I mean, obviously everybody knows about NFC cards, but I think the combination of NFC cards and and low cost uh, point of sale terminals is really something that can kickstart the circular economy, particularly in the global south. Um, you know, in, in our experience, one of the things that's really quite a stumbling block sometimes is, you know, even with the feature phones where you can, you know, through Machankura, and I'm sure in the future it'll be more, where you can use Bitcoin without a high-end smartphone, having, needing to have a phone is always going to be a bit of a stumbling block mm. in terms of giving anyone and everyone access to Bitcoin. But with NFC cards, I mean, those things are really cheap. You know, and this is why Fernando has been able to onboard 400 children or something to that effect. I'm not sure exactly of the numbers, but it's a big number of children that are basically buying fruits on a daily basis. And it's because you can give them a card and, and we're doing something very similar in, in our program. And and he was um, he launched the crowdfunding campaign uh, for these machines because he needs to get the initial order above a certain number to bring the cost down below a certain right. level. So that's hyper Bitcoinized POS. Hyper Bitcoinized POS machine. If you could, um, yeah, that you know, people should really have a look at that. It's a, it's a fantastic, fan I mean, Fernando is so passionate. Um, I think he, I think he sold sixteen machines uh, at the conference. The conference. Yeah, he sure. brought he brought thirty with him. And he wanted to give half away and sell half. So he sold slightly over half. And uh, the rest of the machines are going to circular Bitcoin economies. I'm flying back to South Africa with with seven of them. Um, and I, I did, this is something that he's super passionate about. And I'm also pretty excited about it. I mean, I wasn't so... The first time I encountered this, I was kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean having to put a special device in a shop it, it kind of mm. seems kind of seems like there's, there's too much friction but after watching in in our own project after watching 40 kids going out and spending with these cards and realizing that oh shit i don't actually have to give the kids phones anymore because that's the mm. big that's the mm. big problem is that how do you, if, if I want to go into one of the local primary schools, for example, and roll out the program where kids get rewards 
in SATs for performing certain tasks or getting certain marks or whatever. They, like having to give out phones is always going to be an issue. If you can do it with cards, then then that's great. But obviously then you sit with a situation where none of the shops where you onboard are going to have a high-end phone. Because we actually tested this. You need a pretty high-end phone with a with, with, with an NFC card reader. And, and no one in the community that we uh, operate in had one of those phones. And the POS machine really brings that threshold down. So right. yeah, people should check out that fundraiser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll definitely link it. Cool. Um, so, and in terms of um, conferences, Bitcoin conferences, there's one being planned uh, in Cape Town, right? Do you have more information yes. on that? Yeah, uh, there is a conference being planned for the end of January, 2024. Uh, it's going to be a really small, intimate event. Um, I'm I'm part of the you know, small little team, a really small team of people <laughs> planning it. Uh, I think we're aiming for like 250, maybe 300 people. Um, it's going to be a day and a half. Um, so it'll be a full Saturday and then half a Sunday. Um, and we'll probably, we'll probably combine it with some sort of an excursion to, to three circular economy projects because there's now addition to our project, but when Ikasi, there's two other very successful projects. Um, in the that, country, in South Africa. Yeah, right, right next to to Mossel Bay. So in two in two towns adjacent to Mossel Bay, two other projects popped up, um, which for me is fantastic because that's exactly why I started with Kwenekasi. I, I I wanted to see this thing pop up all over the place. Um, so we'll combine a visit to all three of these projects, um, which uh, yeah, I, I I really look forward to it. I hope we can pull it off. I believe we can. We've got a pretty cool team of people, mm. very small, but you know right. dedicated right do you think brendan there's uh at one point going to be a conference in uganda doesn't have to be international it could be just for the for the locals right yeah i mean this is something i'd uh i'd, I'd be willing to do but um as per now i feel we we need the the person to person impact more mm -hmm. whereby uh, uh these people can then grow the circle of people that will be attending that conference but we already have quite a number of um, people i'm sure would attend even from neighboring kenya because in the region we have a vibrant bitcoin uh, uh, different communities so a conference is most likely but not right now maybe the exciting thing that we're trying to do that bitcoiners can try out is uh, we have uh, talked to a tours and travels company we talk to them about bitcoin so the initiative that we're running we've called it gorilla sats because uganda has more than 50 percent of the world's mountain gorillas and uh, what we're trying to do is create an experience like a getaway experience for bitcoiners where they come in and travel from the airport to to the natural habitats of these gorillas tour along the way, get to experience the country, and this will be paid for in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So along the way, whoever is, uh, whoever uh, whoever vendors we shall work with will get, will accept Bitcoin. It's a scanty idea that I'm trying to work on. Uh, just consider it a way to relax for Bitcoiners. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. And you have nice. something similar, right? Like some tour or travel uh, yeah. on Bitcoin. I mean, I mean, we've been we've been organizing surf trips for for quite some time, and that that was actually my entry point into Bitcoin way back in the day. Yeah. So yeah, we 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 offer we offer surf trips uh, for for Bitcoin. It's it's not di directly related to the Ekasi project. Um, well, it is directly related in the sense that that's what pays the bills. Uh, <laughs> which allows me to work on Bitcoin Ekasi to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we we organize surf trips up and down the South African coast and we accept payment in Bitcoin. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, look, my my, my story actually started with, with with that because it, you know, it, it was it was a, a group of Ukrainians that were stuck behind sanctions in 2015 who sent me my first Bitcoin payment. Um, and since then, it's just been very obvious that this is this is what gives people freedom, you know. The fact that I could receive a payment from the other side of the planet, peer to peer, within a matter of minutes, and not even the world's most powerful government could stop it. 
Um, so yeah, but we we do surf trips. We accept payment in Bitcoin. And we're more than happy to to accept payment. In fact, we'll give you a small discount if you pay in Bitcoin too. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Or like, shouldn't be all the discount in Bitcoin, but uh, like an uh, upmark uh, in fiat, if you pay in fiat. It's more expensive. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Even better, yeah. It's, it's better marketing. Yeah, I mean, we do that. Or we have to do that because of, of the fees. You know, if if people insist on making a bank transfer, we have to add fees yeah. because the banks take Sucks. take such a take such a large cut that it's you can't you can't you know price that in. <laughs> right. right. So um, I'd like to end the podcast on a little bit uh, lighter note, uh, non Bitcoin related. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about uh, the national cuisine of uh, your particular country. So in here, we went for a lunch before that, and uh, you had a good, uh, good uh, chance to try uh, schnitzel and the potato salad, so typical Czech, uh, Czech cuisine, and uh, the dumplings, the cream sauce and a beef, uh, Beef, uh, you know, like uh, roast, yeah. yeah, roast beef. Um, that's called svíčková in Czech for the listeners. So uh, that's probably quite uh, exotic for you, right? And uh, what what's yeah. your typical cuisine? I mean, um, it was really really great food. First of all, I mean, I'll be <laughs> looking out for it a lot. Uh, locally, we we have a variety. The, the the advantage with Uganda is it it sits in a very fertile place. Mm -hmm. The sun is always there. The climate is great. So there's like a variety of of uh, food across the different cultures. We have about 54 tribes in the same small the Ugandas. You'll see it on the map. So there's a lot of delicacies that come up. But overall, the unique things that you'll find will have matoke which is not very common in in different regions of the world. Uh, banana, it's, uh, it's like a yellow banana, but you cook it. Mm -hmm. So you don't wait for it to get yellow. It's really nice. And then there's uh, posho as table food and beans, but um, there are local delicacies that differ according to tribes. I can't go into all of them. Right. The most exciting one, though, is uh, a snack that... Uh, comes to unite all these delicacies because everyone enjoys it across the country. And we call it a Rolex, not the watch. <laughs> <laughs> Most people think it's the watch, <laughs> but uh, we call it a Rolex. Why? Because uh, it's basically a chapati. If you've uh, explored with Indian uh, culture, uh -huh. there's something that we make that is almost like that, but a bit different. So it's a chapati then rolled with... Um, fried eggs with vegetables in mm -hmm. and then it's rolled together to become a roll yeah. so it, it's basically from roll eggs but becomes Rolex right yeah. yeah ah I get it <laughs> yeah yeah course. yeah <laughs> sounds delicious how yeah. about uh, how about the meat like uh, what's uh, you, you like uh, eat beef or what's um, the main staple meat the main staple meat would be beef And there's a lot of goat meat on the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are the starters, but there's chicken, there's there's uh, pork. Oh, pork might be second. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's might be personal opinion also, but <laughs> there's a lot of pork also down there. So yeah, but uh, uh, beef tops, tops right. the list, yeah. Right, uh, how is it in uh, South Africa? Uh, I mean, The national cuisine is more of a ritual than a cuisine. Um, it's it's funny that you should ask that question because there's there's very 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 few things that everyone in South Africa have in common. The country is essentially a country of immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, everyone, everyone, including the Black African tribes, migrated to South Africa. The only indigenous people of South Africa no longer exist. Mm. So that's like essentially a big country of of immigrants, people who immigrated into the country at different times, um, which means that it's a very very uh, diverse country, and it's it's hard to say what the national cuisine is. But there is one thing that everybody have in common, and that is f cooking meat on a fire. 
-hmm. And this sounds very normal. Everybody around the world says, yeah, but we also do that. But the difference is, there's two differences. The first difference is you actually use wood. You don't use coals or charcoal, or it's actual actual wood. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of uh, invasive uh, alien uh, species in terms of trees that have been brought over the years with, with with colonization. So these things have to be get rid of anyway, and we might as well chop them down and burn them to to cook meat. Mm -hmm. You know, do mm -hmm. something useful with them. Um, and the second thing is it happens regularly. So it's not like a once every three months special occasion thing. People do it. You know, it's as normal as as eating porridge in the morning. Um, you'd make fire on a you know Wednesday afternoon or a Friday afternoon or a you know whenever you can. Um, and and cook and cook meat over the fire. It's called a braai. Uh, yeah. We call it uh, we call it braai. What you cook on that fire? I mean, it could be anything. It's you know obviously meat, but uh, beef steaks, uh, sausages, traditional sausages, um, chicken kebabs, whatever. Um, but the point is, it's got to be a fire. It's got to be lots of smoke. You smell like a, you know, you smell like a firefighter <laughs> after you leave. Um, and it's more about, it's more about the ritual of making the fire, watching the fire burn out, getting the smoke in your eyes. Um, it's more about that than what it is actually what you put on the fire afterwards. Right. Um, although the country obviously has great quality meat, it's, it's pretty easy to find free range, uh, free range uh, meat, um, yeah, great quality meat at very affordable prices, uh, relatively speaking. Um, it's it's sort of like, it, it. I mean, I was very much reminded of my own, I was very much reminded of South Africa when I traveled to Argentina, because that's the one other place where I encountered, you know, fantastic quality meat at fantastic prices. And it's not strange to go out to a restaurant and get a really big portion of meat for a very affordable price. Mm, that sounds lovely. Yeah, <laughs> and you also do uh, biltong, right? And but it's not like a jerky; it's slightly different, is it? Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I guess the, the you know in, in in America you'd call it you'd call it jerky, but yeah, in, in South Africa we call it biltong. Um, the process is, I guess, it's a little bit more, a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more common in South Africa than than what it is in other places. In fact, it's very common in South Africa. It's not a it's not even a delicacy, really. It's people eat it as a regular snack. I mean, it's something like if, if, if I if I have to drive and I don't have time to to make something, I would grab one of those packets and we've got, you know, all, always have at least some of it standing in the pantry cupboard, grab one and throw it in the car and then drive and eat that while I drive. Mm. It's a... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's good. That's much better have than you, have having you tried, a or something. Have, have you tried the one that I brought for you? Yeah, you brought um, you brought me several packs of biltong, yeah, which yeah, I'm very thankful yeah. for. And <laughs> it's actually uh, I have a funny anecdote because uh, I opened the the ostrich one, yeah. the ostrich biltong, and I ate just a couple of pieces, and then I left it on the table. And my four year old daughter, she came up, she tasted it, and she ate the whole bag. <laughs> 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 Even kids really love it; like it was really delicious. <laughs> Okay, and, cool. Yeah, so I didn't get much of that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the ostrich meat is also an interesting one. That's also actually not a delicacy in South Africa. It's a, it's a very affordable type of meat. Uh -huh. um, I mean, ostrich is a massive bird; it can't fly, but it's a bird, um, and it's a red meat. So it's not a it's not a white meat, uh, but it's 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 a red meat bird. It's kind of a kind of a strange thing, but it's not actually a delicacy. It's a very it's I mean it's pretty much the same price as beef. Um, very healthy meat because you can't you, you can't raise them in captivity mm. because they've got these massive legs they have to run around so it kind of if you buy ostrich it's almost by default going to be free range because right. you you cannot raise these things like you would raise a chicken it just it would kick down the yeah. play, it would kick the house down so so to speak so that, that's cool. Yeah. And speaking of ostriches, uh, are you guys on Noster? Like, what's so yeah. like a segue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't use Noster as often as I as I would want to. Um, I, I'm actually very, very, you know, passionate about decentralizing everything as far as you can. So for me, Noster is like, yeah, I should really spend more time on there. Um, you know, Twitter kind of sucks you in. Yeah. Um, but I am on Nostria. Yeah. So uh, if you send me your end pops later, I can uh, publish it along with the video. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. Will do. Yeah. No problem. And otherwise, uh, where can people reach you? See your see your content and stuff like that. 
Um, I mean, yeah, I guess Twitter. Um, I've, you know, since since starting Bitcoin Nekasi, I've climbed off of all other social media platforms. I can only, that's one, that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm not really on Nostra. I can't handle more than one social media platform. So basically on Twitter, uh, there's the, the ad Bitcoin Nekasi profile. I mean, there's a couple of scam profiles that imitate it. So just be careful for the spelling. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, we have a website, which is BitcoinNekasi.com. Right. And how about you, Brandon? Mm, yeah, I so the initiative we're going to run has a handle at Gorilla Sats, and uh, my personal account is my full name's at Brindon Mwini. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll yeah. yeah, on uh, I also struggle with uh, Nostra the same way. We do not have any other active uh, social medias, so you'll most definitely find us there. And then we have a website that is coming together, still uh, gorillasats.com. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for your time for this podcast. I hope uh, we'll get a chance to talk at some other time, some other place. It's uh, kind of hard to <laughs> get together in one room. <laughs> I mean, the only assured uh, time is next year, BTC Prague. 100%. Yeah, yeah. there is going to be BTC Prague 24. So yeah. yeah. We'll do it again. I'm definitely coming back for that one. <laughs> no doubt about it. I'm coming prepared this time yeah. around. Perfect, perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Have a cool good man. trip back to your home countries. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to Stackway Podcast. You can check out my stuff at uh, Twitter. I am at Sads Joseph. And uh, just recently, I got a new book published that's called Bitcoin, Separation of Money and State, available at brains.com. And this show is brought to you by Trezor, hardware wallets, trezor.io, Brains, Bitcoin mining tools, brains.com, and biomasichko.cz, a Czech beef farm for the highest quality beef. That's it, and see you next time.